So welcome to the first of the parallel sessions on COVID-19. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Eunice Leung from UCL. Eunice is a recent graduate in population health sciences at UCL. With experience working in climate change and sustainability, she has worked with UNICEF and UNDP Malaysia to research climate change awareness among Malaysian youth and she's led a statewide school competition to raise environmental awareness among school children. Recently, she completed an internship at a built environment not-for-profit, Future of London, where she researched and wrote about the challenges facing the sector in a post-COVID era and ways to facilitate an inclusive recovery. Eunice is interested in the interaction between people and place and the role of the built environment in promoting health and well-being. Looking towards a career in public health and the built environment, she will be pursuing a master's degree in health and urban development this September at UCL's Bartlett School of Planning. So over to you, Eunice. Uh, hi, my name is Eunice. I'm a recent graduate of Population Health Sciences at UCL. I'll be presenting a study I did with my supervisor, Terry, on how changes in social environments have impacted smoking among young adults during the COVID-19 pandemic. To define what we mean by social environments, social environments encompass the immediate physical surroundings and social relationships within which defined groups of people function and interact. Social environments are dynamic and change over time as a result of both internal and external forces. And we know for certain from the pandemic that this has forced the way we live to undergo profound changes. Uh, so why is this important? Lockdown and social distancing regulations implemented across the globe have induced a range of impacts on smoking behavior, many of which remain poorly understood. Research by Jackson and colleagues who found smoking prevalence among young adults aged 18 to 34 years increased by 25% during the first lockdown alone. Additionally, smoking initiation is shifting from teens to young adults. So in 2020, although more young adults have successfully quit smoking, there are also those who have initiated their first cigarette at the same time. Secondly, as mentioned earlier, these social environments have been massively disrupted as a result of the pandemic. Examples of disruptions in social environments include university closures and online classes, moving from independent housing to back home with parents, and even transitioning in and out of lockdowns multiple times throughout the year. How smoking patterns have changed as a result of these varying environments subjected to individuals remain unknown. And lastly, exploring these changes are important in informing tobacco control policies in the post-COVID era among an age group that largely contributes to smoking in the UK if we're to achieve the UK government's ambition of a smoke-free England by 2030. In this study, we aim to address how smoking behavior in young adults during the pandemic can be better understood by considering changes in their social environments and social interactions, and whether these changes have had different impacts on smoking between young adults based on their student status before the outbreak. And to achieve these aims, we examine the association between different COVID-19 restrictions defined through time, as well as changes in the frequency of social interaction to the corresponding risk of smoking. And student status before the outbreak was examined to test associations for the above objectives. The Millennium Court study was used for this study. So this slide shows all the sweeps from the MCS that was used as the sample in our analysis. The MCS is a nationally representative sample of babies born across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland in 2000 to 2002. And the MCS is established to chart the circumstances, growth, and development of children in the UK. And is designed to be a representative of the UK population, which began with an original sample of 18,818 cohort members. Our study used data from the first sweep of the MCS from the 2000 to 2002, the seventh sweep in 2018, and most recently, the COVID-19 surveys that were conducted across three waves from 2020 to 2021. The first wave was conducted during the height of the first lockdown in May 2020, the second a few months later when restrictions were eased, and the next in 2021 during the third national lockdown. And using the MCS as a data set over this period of time provides a really great and relevant timeline to evaluate effects of different COVID-19 restrictions and the different social environments experienced by cohort members. Smoking in wave three was only measured in those who participated online and had participated in either waves one or two of the COVID-19 survey. So in keeping with the flow of data collection on smoking across these waves, the analytic sample comprised all participants recruited at baseline, followed at age 17, who participated online in wave three of the COVID-19 survey, and also participated in either waves one or two, amounting to 2,254 participants. 
Smoking behavior was measured by cohort member smoking status reported in the COVID-19 survey, psychotomized as smoker versus non-smoker. We had three exposure variables, which were time, which was meant to show the differences in COVID-19 regulations and changes in social interaction to account for a social environment. And the latter two variables were measured by the questions in the last seven days, how many days that you meet up in person with any of your family or friends who do not live with you. And in the last seven days on how many days that you give help to people outside of your household affected by coronavirus or the current restrictions. And so helping others include activities such as shopping, collecting medicines, checking in on people and any other voluntary work for communities or other organizations. 11 covariates were selected across three different time points at baseline, at sweep seven, at the age of 17, and across the COVID-19 waves one to three at the ages of 19 to 20. At baseline, time invariant covariates included court members' ethnicity, parents' socioeconomic status measured by home ownership, and parents' smoking status. Smoking status, binge drinking, um, defined as more than five alcoholic drinks on a single occasion, Psychological distress and long-standing illness were included from sweep seven at age 17, whereas sex and country of residence were included at age 19 to 20. And time varying covariates at age 19 to 20 included participants' relationship status and whether or not they were living with parents. Student status was included as a modifier, and this was based on participant student status before the pandemic on whether or not they attended university. So using random intercept Poisson regression models, we examined within person differences in current smoking by levels of COVID-19 restrictions over time and social interactions, controlling for covariates at birth age 17 and ages 19 to 20. And analyses were adjusted using non-response weights provided in wave three of the COVID-19 survey to account for attrition. As you can see from the table, these associations were tested by building partially adjusted and fully adjusted models with the three main exposure variables with the different covariates. Time was modeled as a categorical variable using wave one, which is May 2020 as a reference category, and time invariant covariates were included on all of these models. Our main findings included that in this age group, compared with the first national lockdown in May 2020, the easing of COVID-19 restrictions in later months was associated with an increased risk of smoking. So compared with the first wave in May, young adults were 74% more likely to smoke in wave two, which was September to October 2020, when lockdown restrictions eased, and 44% more likely to smoke in wave three, which was February to March 2021, during the third national lockdown. Secondly, a higher frequency of social interactions with people outside the household was associated with a higher risk of smoking. Participants who met people outside their household twice or more times a week were more likely to smoke than those who never left their household to do so. And participants who helped people outside their household, however, did not have a different risk of smoking compared to those who never left the house to help people. We also tested differences in the associations of three main exposure variables by university student status by adding interaction terms. And from the interaction tests, we found that the risk of smoking across time points differed by student status. So compared with May 2020, which is denoted here as wave one, there was a larger increase in the risk of smoking in wave two, which was September 2020, among university students than non-university students. And this difference, also pers this difference was persistent in wave three. So compared with the first wave, there was a larger increase in the risk of smoking in February to March 2021 among university students than non-university students. There was, however, no significant difference in associations for both the social interaction variables. There were several limitations in our study, including a low response rate, so the analytical sample for the study was restricted in that smoking behavior measured in wave three of the COVID-19 survey was asked only to those who had participated in waves one or two and used the web questionnaire online in wave three. And this reduced the potential sample size available for the study by excluding those who participated over telephone and the newer recruits in wave three. The findings are limited by the number and timing of the waves in which data collection was produced in the COVID-19 Two more waves. minutes. Okay. Analyzing more time points spread across other lockdown stages may have yielded different findings due to the ever rapid changes in COVID-19 regulations. We also would ideally have liked to measure the places in which participants were meeting and helping other people. And for example, whether this was done in leisure places that sell alcohol to explore the nuances in the types of social, social interactions that encourage smoking in this age group. These findings contribute to a growing body of work that highlights the magnitude of fluctuations in the risk of smoking among young adults since the start of the pandemic and the importance of social environments in understanding the mechanisms at play, including across socioeconomic groups. The study supports the need for continued attention to smoking prevention among young adults and new place-based interventions where they be more susceptible to smoking. 
The larger changes in the risk of smoking among university students also caused attention to the role of higher education institutions in supporting these smoking prevention efforts. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for an excellent um, presentation. And because everybody's automatically on mute, I'm clapping on behalf of everybody. Okay, so thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And we will now turn to Andrew Bryce from the University of Sheffield, where he's a research associate. He was part of a research program funded by the Health Foundation, looking at the effects of health on labour market outcomes, including the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. He's currently researching the disability employment gap in the UK in a project funded by the Nuffield Foundation. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, can you hear me okay? Am I coming through? Yes, fine. Great. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, so my name's uh, Andy and uh, uh, I'm presenting joint work with Mark Bryan and Jenny Roberts. And we're all at the University of Sheffield, where, I'm, where I am uh, right now. Uh, and the name of this paper is Employment Related COVID-19 Exposure Risk Among Disabled People in the UK. And I want to say thank you to the Health Foundation for funding this work. Uh, so first of all, a, uh, just a summary of the work that we uh, did. So there's a lot of evidence, uh, for example, from the uh, World Health Organization that uh, workplaces uh, can be a fertile territory for the transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19. And particular workplaces are more risky than others. Um, and what we found in our study was that in the UK, disabled people were significantly less likely to work from home and more likely to be working outside the home during the pandemic. So it seems that disabled people were more at risk of picking up the virus through work than non-disabled people. Not only that, but they were also more highly concentrated in occupations with a high risk of exposure to COVID-19. So this all adds to evidence that disabled people experienced a particularly raw deal during the pandemic and helps to explain why three in five people who died from COVID-19 were disabled. Now, at the start of the pandemic, um, we, uh, I remember it being said that the virus doesn't discriminate, uh, but actually lots of evidence that has been collected since uh, has really uh, thrown that out the water. The virus very much does discriminate. In fact, you could say that we're all in the same storm, but we are in different boats. Now, when I first put together this slide, it was noted to me that putting a cruise ship here probably wasn't the most appropriate thing because actually, uh, when it comes to uh, the spread of COVID, uh, cruise ships are actually one of the most risky environments for, uh, for the spread of the, uh, of the disease. And so um, actually, you're probably gonna be much better off marooned on your own on a, on a dinghy in the middle of the ocean uh, in terms of uh, COVID safety than you are on a packed cruise ship. But hopefully uh, the, the pictures do uh, sort of uh, uh, give you an idea of, of the analogy here. So clearly, when the you know when you're when you're on a stormy sea, you'd much prefer to be in a in a, in a big boat than uh, than in a little dinghy. And so it's been very similar uh, with uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, so to give an example of that, um, there's been a huge amount written about the disproportionate effect of um, COVID uh, um, uh, exposure and indeed COVID deaths among people. Uh, of uh, black and minority ethnic groups. Um, but there's been less uh, written about uh, disability and how uh, COVID has uh, disproportionately impacted disabled people. And this is the, the, in spite of this uh, very sobering fact that 60% uh, of COVID deaths up to November 2020 in the UK were among disabled people. Now, of course, you can argue here that that's maybe not surprising because of the um, uh, the profile of disabled people tend to be older on average and uh, more likely to have underlying health conditions. And therefore, if you, um, if you do get uh, uh, infected, it is more likely to, uh, to lead to serious illness and death. But the, uh, the ONS uh, data that looks at this, uh, in fact, even when they account for age and underlying health conditions, which are in indicators of clinical vulnerability, disabled people still had higher death rates than non-disabled. And so we're clearly more exposed uh, to the virus in the first place. And so that this is sort of the motivation for uh, this study. 
So let's um, have a look at the data that we use. Well, we use the Understanding Society. And as you saw in Mina's presentation, uh, we looked at the, uh, we used the, the COVID waves. So these were additional, um, uh, initially mon monthly up to July 2020, and then bi-monthly uh, uh, on to uh, March 2021, um, online surveys uh, conducted with the uh, Understanding Society panel. So we found this to be really uh, rich data to really find out about what people in the UK were doing during the pandemic. So we particularly used data on uh, whether people were employed, the number of hours they worked in the week, and whether they often or always worked at home. And this enabled us to, to split people up into those who worked at home, those who were on furlough, so they were still employed, but they didn't do any um, uh, any uh, hours uh, and then the remainder which is those that were continuing to do a positive number of hours but were not working at home and therefore were going out to work and and, uh, and, and therefore uh, coming into physical uh, contact with others. Um, we also uh, matched in data from the latest wave of the regular uh, um, Understanding Society uh, survey um, so that was wave 10 or 11 to uh, identify the uh, uh, health um, uh, related characteristics of people in the sample. So we were able to split off disabled people. And these were defined as those with a long standing physical or mental impairment, illness, or disability, who also, uh, when presented with a list of particular uh, specified uh, uh, functions, for example, mobility, uh, memory, lifting, et cetera, if they indicated that they had at least one. Uh, of uh, difficulty with at least one of these functions uh, and had a long-standing physical or mental impairment, then they're identified as disabled. And we feel that this is very close to the Equality Act 2010 definition of disabled people, which is what we still use uh, today in terms of equality legislation. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, for those who were employed, we are, were able to identify their occupation in, uh, in 2019 before the pandemic. And, uh, and then this occupation was then matched to what was a called what we called a risk indication factor, which is based on work by Kikuchi and Kurana, who um, uh, used uh, 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 job quality measures from, uh, from ONET to, uh, to identify the extent to which each uh, occupation uh, in the UK classifications, um, uh, the extent to which they were at risk of, uh, of uh, spread of COVID. So let's just explore that a little bit more. So uh, essentially there were, the ONET at, um, uh, uh, provides data on a whole range of job characteristics. And these were the two that we particularly focused on. So physical proximity to others, the extent to which, how close are you actually in contact with other people while you're at work? So for example, hairdressers were, actually the top ranking one in terms of physical proximity to others. And then the other uh, job characteristic was exposure to disease, the extent to which you're, you're exposed to disease in your work. And here, um, it was a fact that nursing and midwifery professionals who uh, were at the top of that list. And um, by combining those two characteristics, um, so those that scored high on both those measures were the most high risk occupations. And indeed, the majority of, of these top risk occupations were in the health and social care uh, sectors. Uh, and indeed, these were a lot of these were key workers who were continuing to, to, uh, to go out to the workplace uh, during the pandemic. So uh, let's just look at uh, our results. So the first thing uh, to note is that disabled people were less likely to work from home. So even uh, back in January, February 2020, uh, before lockdown, but um, arguably, you know, the virus was still circulating around at this time. Um, uh, disabled people, the blue line, were significantly less likely to work from home than uh, the non-disabled population. Um, and uh, this gap increased um, in April 2020 when we went into lockdown. And in fact, was sustained right through the pandemic. And even if we take into account um, people who were, who were furloughed, and therefore um, uh, we're, we're staying at home for that reason, uh, we still find that in most months, uh, disabled people were significantly more likely to be going out to work. Just uh, over a minute left, Andy. Okay, uh, they were more likely to be going out to work uh, during, the, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and also uh, when, we, when we look at this risk indication factor, so this is among people who were working outside the home, we see that disabled people were on average in more risky 
um, uh, jobs than non-disabled people. So what uh, have we learned from this? Well, first thing to say is that um, disabled people actually um, are much less likely to be employed than non-disabled people. So that is uh, an inequality in itself. And so the UK government wants to um, close this gap. Uh, and this is a, you know, a, a laudable aim. However, what we show is this, that comes with with risks. Uh, as Laura said, was saying earlier, uh, COVID-19 is, is still with us. Uh, and even if we get to the end of this pandemic, there's still the risk of further similar um, uh, diseases coming, uh, coming through. And so we do need to learn from this and make sure that it's possible for um, disabled people uh, to get into work, uh, but for it to be a safe and inclusive place for them to work. And I've just noted down here a few ideas that, uh, that uh, I think would help to re redress this balance. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. And uh, we'll move on now to Chris Deeming from the University of Strathclyde, where he's a senior lecturer. He has interest in secondary data analysis, subjective well-being and social attitudes. He's currently working on a UKRI COVID-19 project, analysing ONS Secure Research Service data. And he's going to be talking to us about coronavirus restrictions and subjective well-being. Excellent. Thank you very much. OK, so um, I'm talking about a small project uh, that I'm currently working on, uh, which is funded by the, uh, the ESRC. And uh, it's involving uh, ONS uh, survey data from the OPN, and that is the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey. Uh, and I'm specifically interested in the impact that uh, lockdown laws and restrictions had on people's self-reported or subjective well-being. So this is what I'll address in my presentation. OK, so the motivations for this study really were, um, in, in theory at least, I'll come on to the practicalities of actually doing the assessment, but I was interested in the impact uh, of the uh, pandemic on subjective well-being, uh, and also the duration of the pandemic, and also the impact of restrictions on subjective well-being. Uh, I'm interested in uh, the UK as a whole, but also in the uh, nations of the UK, England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, and I'm interested in particularly the impact of school shutdowns, work closures and stay at home uh, uh, measures in the pandemic. Uh, and the furlough as well, uh, the furlough scheme, and uh, particularly the impact of these policies, these public health policies on subjective well-being. Can we can we assess the impact of the pandemic and also the the public health policies on subjective well-being and on different sections of the population? So I'm interested in geography, uh, countries, and also different sections sections of the population. OK, so the policy context, really, are there some UK wide uh, lockdown laws, for example, but there are also variations within the different UK nations uh, and some countries, uh, devolved administrations actually uh, uh, making uh, their own lockdown laws. So there is some variation. And for people interested in modelling and statistics, uh, variation is interesting because we can look at the data and start to examine it and try to explain the impact of the different variations and the different measures on people's subjective well-being. We're certainly interested in things like the timing of the different lockdown laws, the duration, the stringency of the policy responses in the devolved administrations as well. And the University of Oxford have been doing some work on, on the stringency, scoring the, the stringency, the toughness really perhaps of the of the lockdown measures. So we have we have some good we have some good scores to model and we have some good data from the OPN survey. In a sense, uh, it creates the situation creates what we might think of as a natural experiment. And then we can look at the impact of these different restrictions that come into play at different times and are lifted at different times in different uh, constituent countries of the UK. And things like the job retention scheme as well, uh, looking at the well-being of people uh, who, who are on that scheme. So the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey is a long-standing survey. It was established in 2012, a merger of two, uh, two existing surveys. It's a cross-sectional survey and subject to the usual uh, issues across sectional surveys. 
it's a relatively small survey in, in the outset of 1,100 adults, so it's, it's meant to be a representative uh, to a degree uh, as, of adults in the British population. And it's a long-standing survey that has been used by the ONS to look at uh, issues of immediate policy interest. In the COVID, in the pandemic, uh, the survey was increased, a much larger sample size, up to 6,000 adults surveyed more, more or less on a continual basis and social impacts was broadly defined across a range of indicators really in questions, impacts on caring, well-being and things like that, it particularly impacts on well-being, this, this of concern here. So this was, this was rolled out in, in March and has been running continuously uh, during the pandemic and, 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 and continues to do so. For the study, we pulled 50 waves of this survey data. This survey data is, is uh, accessible by the uh, via the ONS uh, Secure Research Service. So we pull the data uh, throughout the uh, 2000s and 2001, which gives us a, a large sample size of 150,000 respondents. And we can use that then to start to look at the pandemic across time space and under different lockdown restrictions. I use a uh, lots of different regression techniques. I'm not going to report all the results today because it's the, the analysis is still ongoing in terms of the modeling. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in subjective well-being and the OPN survey uses standard uh, subjective well-being questions across the ONS suite of uh, social surveys, but also a lot of the international social surveys use these questions as well. And if we look at the look at some of the indicators, for example, this is people's satisfaction scores. What I'm trying to do is set this against a uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, baseline, which represents February 2019, which is the red line, and then looking at satisfaction scores on average in the population in this, in this, instant, in this instance uh, throughout the pandemic, and then trying to introduce in the statistical modelling certainly uh, different uh, lockdown measures. I'm illustrating this here with the second national lockdown or the UK one uh, to, to, to show the impact of, of these lockdown measures on people's satisfaction within the pandemic against different policies, but also against the, the baseline measure uh, pre-pandemic February 2019. And so I have the four different subjective wellbeing scores from the ONS, satisfaction, uh, the worthwhileness, how worthwhile is life, uh, and again, against the, uh, the pre-pandemic baseline and the average scores throughout the pandemic. Uh, this is the, the uh, average data from the 50 merged uh, or pooled uh, OPN data sets. Also happiness scores, we can see the happiness drops uh, in the pandemic as might be expected, the reported happiness. Uh, and we can see the different impacts of these and restrictions as people's happiness returned the close to uh, the pre-pandemic uh, baseline restrictions in England and in Scotland we see increasing and then the impact of the second UK uh, lockdown uh, in, in, in uh, early January. So this is happiness scores and then I have anxiety scores as well and, and the baseline is low anxiety and anxiety understandably in the uh, UK population is raised during the pandemic initially quite significantly high at the start and then dropping uh, as, as lockdown measures are introduced. And we can also see a, a spike actually, which I've marked on the chart, which is the, uh, the peak daily COVID-19 deaths uh, peaking there. And we can see that population anxiety does indeed spike around this time as there's concern about the pandemic and the introduction of the lockdown as well, which actually reduces anxiety. People seem to, uh, their anxiety eases a bit as, as lockdown measures to prevent the spread of COVID are introduced. Two so minutes, all this, Chris. Uh, yeah, all these things are going on. So there is a lot we can do uh, with this data. Um, on the whole, um, subjective well-being does decline. Happiness is, 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 is shows a different story here, is that, that there is some return, uh, increase in happiness throughout the pandemic, where the other measures are largely negative. Um, there are challenges of using this data um, because I'm interested in trying to separate the pandemic effect from the policy effect, as it were, because uh, some of these things are uh, going on and they're integrated and trying to disentangle this is quite complicated. Uh, when the emergency is announced at the global level in the UK, when the ONS start to collect data, there are also differences 
uh, between the countries, but a lot of the countries uh, follow similar patterns in their lockdown laws to a degree. So it makes it harder to model. On the on the plus side, uh, there are some good variables in the data set which we can use uh, more than the global policy responses uh, to look at people's well-being, and that's particular variables and questions relating to the experience of home working, homeschooling, and being on furlough. Uh, there are issues in subgroup analysis, um, which the ONS caution uh, against doing too much or over-interpreting. Uh, we feel we've got a pretty good sample to look at this. So we're, we are worried about this, of course, but, but we are aware that we can, that we can use this data to at least uh, estimate some uh, impacts of policy on, in, the, in, in the pandemic. Um, the question is, is uh, there was an online survey in the pandemic. So I did some work looking at our representation of our, of our uh, sample in a sense. And we do find it is a, a bit skewed in terms of age, in terms of uh, single people uh, filling out the survey, and in terms of a lower education than, than is uh, reported in other surveys. And our sample are more likely to be homeowners. So we are aware we have a, a different uh uh, sample than might otherwise have got from the face-to-face -face, uh, survey work and, and this is after the correction of the survey weights within the sample as well so it is a, a unique simple a sample that does present issues uh, and uh, this project's got various uh, accreditations and recognitions as well which I'll leave there and there's some references and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. This is a very clever use of data, sort of natural experiment, as you as you uh, say. And it's also, as Eunice will will know, I, I've I use the OPN data on these four questions in my session for under for our population health undergraduates on te on how to measure well being. Um, oh, that's great! Yeah. So, I'd be interested uh, to see your slides on that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I prefer the the, uh, the short web webs myself, but um, we have a debate about it in the class. So. Yeah, I did actually. The ONS did the experimental stuff when David Cameron yeah. announced the well-being measures back in 2011, and yes. I got the experimental data and wrote a paper looking at the distributions uh, back in 2014, something like that, when it was first. Well, with, with the students, we we have a debate about. Uh, a discussion about what time frame one should look at and I think that's one of the differences between the ONS questions and, and the uh, WEMWEBS okay. but we need yep. to move on now so we now turn to our final uh, talk of this session by Edward, Le Edward Webb from the University of Leeds Edward is a senior research fellow at the academic unit of health economics at the University of Leeds where he's worked since 2016 his primary research interests are decision-making, preferences, and valuing health. And he's going to talk to us now about long-term health conditions and labour market outcomes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Cool. Yeah. So I'm uh, Ed Webb from Leeds. I'd like to thank my co-authors. Uh, this work is funded by the Nuffield Foundation, um, although these are my news, my views, uh, not theirs, etc. The motivation behind our study is that there's a large amount of research uh, which shows that um, people with long-term health conditions often have worse labour market outcomes. So that could be, for example, leaving the labour market um, earlier, could be uh, part-time rather than full-time working, um, or it could be um, earning less conditional on participation in the labour market. And I don't think I need to take a long time to convince people that COVID-19 has obviously massively disrupted working patterns, uh, given that we're uh, all still looking at screens rather than actually um, talking to each other. So the idea is that, okay, well, uh, has there been a disproportionate uh, effect of the pandemic on people who already um, uh, uh, had some problems with their labour market participation? And I think this is quite interesting because uh, there are lots of ways that you might think that, oh, okay, this, this could be a negative uh, disproportional impact because it could be that um, uh, adapting to new ways of working is, is just more difficult if you um, uh, struggle with resilience uh, or something like that. But on the other hand, it could be that some aspects of uh, this disruption to working patterns is actually positive for people with long-term conditions. So um, they might find it easier to work from home. Uh, that might benefit uh, disproportionately from avoiding a long commute. 
So our general strategy is that we use um, the Understanding Society, both the main and the COVID-19 surveys, which um, we've heard plenty about already today. So our idea is that we can identify, identify participants with uh, various long-term conditions using the main survey. Uh, we can then match these to people without uh, a given condition on baseline variables. And by baseline, I mean uh, the, the far off halcyon days of January and February uh, 2020. And then we can track the labor market outcomes uh, in the nine waves of the COVID-19 survey. So that's all well and good. So uh, we have a strategy to identify the causal effect of um, having a given long-term condition in that we uh, match people on their baseline characteristics. But I've already said at the start of the presentation that people with long-term conditions often have poorer uh, labor market outcomes anyway. So how do we identify whether, well, if we just track people over uh, a, a given 18 month period that we just see uh, worse labor market outcomes develop over that time. So therefore we uh, construct a kind of sort of counterfactual analysis by um, looking at the relevant outcomes in wave seven to nine of the main survey. So this is the last three waves pre-COVID and there's around about two years uh, on average between people's first and their last observation. So the idea behind that is that we can say that, okay, well, if we see um, uh, uh, an effect of having a long-term condition in the COVID data, we can see, would you just expect to see an effect of a similar magnitude uh, in pre-COVID data? So how do we identify participants? Well, uh, basically we identify people uh, having a given condition if they ever say that they have it prior to March, 2020. So these are the specific variables we look at. Um, in understanding society, there's a bit of a change as to how you ask the, the question about long-term conditions in wave 10 onwards, uh, specifically you distinguish between, for example, different types of arthritis. Um, we uh, don't look at the kind of the, the subcategories. So we don't look at, uh, say, rheumatoid versus musculoskeletal um, or uh, no, rheumatoid versus osteoarthritis, for example. Uh, we just stick to the main category. These are the specific long-term conditions we look at. So we look at asthma, arthritis, cancer, diabetes, uh, liver condition, epilepsy. Uh, in wave 10, there's this category of emotional, nervous, or psychiatric problem introduced. Uh, and we combine that with the main uh, mental health-related condition asked in waves one to nine of the main survey, which is clinical depression. Um, we also, there's a group of conditions which we put together and call vascular conditions. And there's a group of conditions which we put together and call pulmonary conditions. And we don't look at hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism, essentially because they um, were apparently going to be quite boring. Um, I should say that an actual, uh, you know, proper doctor has actually looked through these categorizations. So um, there is at least some medical knowledge going into this. In terms of our matching variables, we match on kind of the usual things, so age, sex, ethnicity. We match on their um, uh, uh, people's work experiences in, uh, in January, February 2020. For example, um, how often they work from home pre-pandemic. Um, uh, we also look at things like whether they identify as a key worker in waves one and two of the COVID survey. Uh, we match on their job type, uh, household size, location. We also match on the number of comorbidities uh, that people have. So how do we match people? So for each condition, we impute their uh, missing baseline variables. Uh, this is done using the MISC forest package for R. And then we use Mahal and Nobis distance matching. So this is a quite similar to propensity score matching. Um, there is certainly a paper out there which argues that it gives you a closer match on all variables. I think matching is one of those things where there's actually quite a lot of different methods and everyone has their favorite ones. This happens to be the one that, uh, that we use. Uh, we also uh, vary the matching ratio based on how many people uh, we find with a given condition. So for people where there's very few people uh, with a given condition, we match on a ratio of four to one. And then where we get over a thousand people with that condition, we just match one to one. 
These are our outcome variables we look at. So we look at a binary variable, whether people are employed or not. We look at the number of hours people work, um, conditional on employment. We often, we look at how often people work from home, conditional on being employed. So that's um, either always hybrid or never. We look at whether people are furloughed at any point in the COVID-19 survey. So there's, there's various furlough related questions asked in the survey and uh, it's quite complicated to combine them. So we just say, okay, binary variable, at any point did you say, yes, I've been furloughed? Uh, we also look at earnings, conditional on employment, household income, and only for people who are under 65 and not on universal credit at baseline, whether at any point during the um, pandemic they uh, start claiming universal credit. Uh, we use uh, cross-sectional uh, models for furlough and universal credit. For other models, we use uh, random effects panel models. Um, and in these uh, panel models, we include a time trend, and we also interact that time trend with uh, whether people have a long-term condition or not. Uh, so just a very quick summary of our results. So uh, the amount of people with the conditions varies. Edward, between you've asthma. got two minutes left. Cool. Um, and which we get over 5,000 uh, down to epilepsy where there's only 130 people. This is a very broad summary of our results. So basically here um, uh, for the panel models, I'm showing you whether the main effect of having a condition and the interactive interaction of having a condition and the time trend is statistically significant. And if it's significant, what area it goes in. And you can see that there's uh, there are interesting patterns here and uh, similarities between some conditions and uh, some differences as well, as well. So we can see that, and if we compare that to the counterfactual COVID-19 analysis, um, basically we find very little there. So um, there's very little uh, when we look at the main period, the main survey data just before uh, COVID-19. So it looks like... Uh, there are various effects of having a long-term condition in terms of worse labor market outcomes. And it, we reckon that this is probably due to COVID-19. There's some similarities between conditions, especially for, most, for people with most conditions, they have a lower likelihood of employment. There's also some differences. For example, we only found a significant uh, increased likelihood of being furloughed for people with pulmonary conditions. And exploring that, they also people with pulmonary conditions also had the biggest reduction in working hours. So we can think uh, there might be various reasons for that. So it could be that employers are driving this. So they saw people at, as, as most at risk and therefore were least likely to ask people to come in. Or it could be that people with co pulmonary conditions were uh, much more cautious. There's some good news. So there's no we don't really see much of a reduction in earnings conditional on employment. But it could just be that um, uh, it takes time to change people contracts. So it might just take time for the, the effect uh, of having a long-term condition during the pandemic to feed through. There's also um, little difference observed in working from home patterns. So we reckon that that could be because a lot of the, con the changes were legally mandated and we would need to look in future how that uh, evolves. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, so people with long-term conditions uh, it looks like they need increased support due to being in the uh, uh, due to COVID-19. So increased support, especially uh, with staying in the labour market. And it doesn't look from our data like the outcomes are equalising by September 2021. Uh, so in future, it'd be useful to see whether effects persist. And also, I think it's quite in important to investigate the causes behind different labour market outcomes. So it, we don't also know whether these changes are necessarily worse for well-being because maybe actually people who left the labor market with lo a long-term condition might that might actually have been beneficial for them uh, and so yep so that's the end of my presentation thanks for listening hello everybody i'd like to start by introducing deborah chilequa um, who we're delighted to have a third year medical student from hull york medical school joining us um, hopefully a start of a very long and distinguished career using health studies. Um, so Deborah is conducting research that explores socio-demographic inequalities in relation to cervical screening uptake in the UK. She has completed a degree in biomedical science and contributed to research 
focusing on developing therapeutic interventions for vaginal and urinary tract infections. So over to you, Deborah. Um, so um, hello, my name is Deborah Chilekwa and the title of my study is uh, Cross-Sectional Analysis of Ethnic Inequalities in Cervical Screening Uptake in the UK Using Understanding Society. Um, so this is just some information on cervical um, cancer and why we're we focusing on it. Um, so globally, cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women. So it does affect a large popular uh, a large population of women. Sorry, um, and to combat its incidence, um, the UK developed a program where the human papillomavirus vaccination was introduced um, to reduce the incidence of cervical cancer. Um, unfortunately, um, the vaccine does not prevent all cervical cancer, so it is very important that women still go routine um, cervical screening. Um, and this is because the 10-year survival rate of cervical cancer is only at 51%. Um, and this means that 49% of women actually die within 10 years of being diagnosed. And this is rather unfortunate because it's approximated that 500 deaths are prevented each year for a relatively simple procedure, which is cervical screening. So essentially this is just a cervical screening flowchart. So you can follow along with what exactly happens. Um, women who are 25 to 64 years old are invited for cervical screening. Um, the patient cervix is examined through um, this lovely piece of equipment on the right called a speculum. Um, a pap smear is taken and sent to the histopathology lab. And um, one of three um, results um, will be given. Um, either you have an infection, either it's normal or it is abnormal, which then further examinations of um, the women's cervix will be um, undergone. Despite the relatively simple procedures, um, cervical screening is at an all-time low. Um, um, it's actually a 19-year low in England, and that is the same across all age groups. Um, socioeconomic inequalities has always thought to be a major contributor um, to low cervical screening uptake, which, with um, low depravity in socioeconomic sector being associated with um, a lower uptake and um, more cervical cancer mortality. So essentially, this graph is um, showing, this is a study that shows that cervical um, cancer um, screening um, is the lowest in the lowest quintile of income deprivation in England and um, unfortunately you cannot see my mouse but what is uh, what if you can kind of just make out that in the first bar um, in the first bar of 2007 the least deprived areas had a higher percentage coverage and in uh, the most deprived areas so the quintile uh, the lowest quintile in of income deprivation um, in the most deprived areas had a lowest percentage of cervical screening coverage. And this was the same from 2007 all the way to 2012. So um, low income deprivation in England is associated with low cervical uh, screening attendance. So um, what we do know is socioeconomic um, inequalities is one factor um, against um, um, that has been extensively studied that affects um, low attendance and cervical screening. Less attention, however, has been um, um, given to um, ethnic inequalities as a contributor of cervical screening. So like do, does um, and women's ethnicity alone affect how often she attends and if she attends for cervical screening. This is in part due to um, poor recording of ethnicity in primary care. And um, some studies have attempted to examine the association between ethnicities um, and ethnicity and cervical screening. Um, there was a study, for example, that found that white British women were more likely to attend cervical screening compared to minority ethnic women. Um, the problem with um, the study, however, was it was unable to disaggregate women beyond white British. So it was white British women in comparison to the rest of um, the ethnic minorities um, in the UK. 
And so that brings me on to, thank you, our next slide, um, which is where we now talk about um, what we wanted to do. So we wanted to look at ethnic groups um, in those minorities and see if there's a difference um, in cervical screening uptake within them. Um, so we use the National Understanding Society data set, which allowed us to compare a wider population of ethnic groups. So, um, so it brings, things, brings me to um, a question, which is the study was aimed to look at whether ethnicity is an independent predictor of cervical screening uptake in the UK. And we controlled for socio-demographic factors, which I will show in the next slide. Thank you. So as mentioned, we used the National Representative um, Survey, Understanding Society, and sampled um, 12,006 um, minority women um, aged 25 to 64 living in the UK. We did this um, and we used um, a weighted and unweighted sample in the next steps. Um, we did cross tabulations um, to examine the relationship between sociodemographic variables on the right and cervical screening uptake. Sociodemic um, variables um, considered were age, ethnicity, religion, educational status, economic activity, IMD score, access to a car or van, the number of GP visits um, a woman makes in 12 months, whether they're born in, outside of the UK, having English as their first language, um, their socioeconomic activity, long-standing illness or disability, and um, their region. And then after this, the significant variables were then put into multivariant analysis using logistic regression to determine if ethnicity was in fact an independent predictor of cervical screening uptake. Um, and next slide, please. So the revol results of the step one, the cross tabulation analysis um, were proven fruitful because we were able to see that ethnicity um, was a significantly related to whether a woman attended cervical screening, among with other socio-demographic variables. And this was the case for both weighted and unweighted data. I will first show the weighted data. The table is quite small. I do apologize. It's getting everything in, into one table. Um, so in the on the left, are all the significant variables um, and the significant socio-demographic variables. And you can see that they're all significant in um, a screening uptake, um, religion, um, educational status, economic status, um, socioeconomic, socioeconomic classification, access to a caravan, um, number of GP visits, being born outside of the UK and having English as a first language. Um, for our study though, what was very important for us was that ethnicity, like I said, was an important contributor. Um, and what was interesting, in fact, as you can see in the red circle, Asian um, women of Asian ethnicity were actually at a much lower percentage at 17.6 um, comparison to um, white women, which was 27.7. And just this is just to say that this was the same for the weighted data as well. Um, the only difference was that English being as a first language and being born in the UK was not a significant variable in the weighted, um, but um, Asian women were also the least likely ethnicity to attend cervical screening. And so in our next step was the logistic regression and where we took the socio-demographic um, variables and uh, wanted to see um, which were the independent um, um, contributors to um, cervical screening uptake. And importantly, as you can see, Asian women was in fact an independent variable um, as to whether women um did in, in fact take uh, go, attend cervical screening sorry um having access to a car or van was also um um significant in um determining whether a woman went through cervical cervical screening and also the number of gp visits that um a woman has was also um very um um, as, a, as it was also a contributor, sorry, to whether um, a woman went through cervical screening. So this is just essentially a summary of the results. Um, so after, uh, as I said, adjusting for the confounding variables, um, ethnicity was an independent predictor, and specifically that um, 
Asian women were much less likely, 32% likely actually due to the um, odds ratio for attending um, seven cervical screening. Um, but interestingly, there were other factors that directly, directly um, affected cervical screening uptake. Um, women were more likely to go for cervical screening if they had access to a car or they had visited the GP a specific number of times. And I think this was from six to 10 visits in 12 months, then they were more likely to have done cervical screening. Um, but however, Asian as an ethnicity is quite a, a broad ethnicity. And so we wanted to um, aggregate, uh, look, look a little bit deeper into um, what groups in between those um, ethnicities um, were also being, could have been affected by um, how often they went to cervical screening. And so this table shows with the unweighted data that, um, um, again, as, as we can, as we knew before, Asian women were the lowest um, to um, uptake for cervical screening. Um, we can actually even see further that it was actually Bangladeshi Asian women who were even um, less, less likely at 11.7% and followed by Pakistani Asian women and then followed by Indian Asian women. And um, we also split up white um, um, ethnicity into um, British, Irish or other white and black and African in, into uh, African and Caribbean, sorry, and um, mixed. And so, um, but we also, there was also another um, variable that we wanted to look at and break down even further, which was religion. Um, religion is quite highly associated with ethnicity. Thank you. And um, so, no religion and religion in our cross tabulations was significantly um, um, contribute contrib was a significant contrib contributor. Sorry to whether women went through cervical screening uptake, and um, when we looked at the different categories within that religion itself, within religion itself, we could find that Muslim women were actually much less um, a, a lower percentage of cervical screening attendance than other any other um, major religions um, in the UK and so we thought to combine um, ethnicity with um, Muslim religion to see if we could add further depth into understanding the type of women who significantly do not attend cervical screening and that brings us to um, the final table and the sensitivity analysis and um, um, to no surprise Prize for us, we actually found that Bangladesh women um, had the lowest percentage um, uptake, which was 10.7%. Um, and this was followed by Pakistani Muslims, um, which was 14.8%. And then um, African Muslims, which had 19%. And then um, two minutes. Other thank you. Other Muslims and um, Indian Muslims as well. So what does that mean um, exactly? Um, so I think our, our study um, supports previous research that ethnicity is in fact a significant factor in predicting cervical screening uptake after adjusting for socioeconomic deprivation and other socio-demographic factors. Um, in highlighting um, ethnic equalities and cervical screening, um, it shows the importance of ensure, ensuring uptake of screening reaches all parts of the population um, so that um, a woman who has the same likelihood of um, being having health care for um, cervical cancer and it's not impacted by what ethnicity she is essentially. Um, this has implications for future research and practice in terms of identifying uptake amongst Asian women um, and as certain studies have shown that language barriers prevent um, a lack of awareness in women. Um, I think um, a lot of women in, in this study were said that if they didn't, they were receiving letters to attend for cervical screening, but they were unable to read the letters. Um, so they didn't really know that they, it, cervical screening was something that they needed to attend. And psychosocial barriers that may be in relation to ethnicity and religion. Um, some studies were also shown that immigrant women felt that their health was not considered a priority in their home country. So now when they came over to the UK, um, 
their health and going for regular checkups again was still not something that they thought that they should take priority over. And so a review of um, interventions to improve cervical screening uptake could be of benefit to um, ethnic minority women and specifically maybe Asian women as our study shown. Um, so a limitation of this study was that it was unable to be conducted longitudinally um, due to the use of cervical screening questions only being asked in wave 10. Um, so um, hopefully if there's more of this of um, cervical screening questions asked, we can follow along and see what happens in the next coming years with cervical screening. So thank you very much for um, allowing me to present. Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce Harrison Smalley from the University of Nottingham. This research was conducted as a master's research project at the University of Nottingham by Harrison Smalley under the supervision of Professor Kim Edwards. Harrison recently completed his medical degree at the University of Leicester, and he has strong interest in public health and sport and exercise medicine. And he's going to talk to us about understanding the burden of chronic back pain. So I'm going to talk about our recent spatial microsimulation study of chronic back pain at ward level in England. So first, to give you a bit of a background about chronic back pain. So chronic back pain is back pain that's present for three months or more. It's sometimes split into lower or lumbar and thoracic back pain. It's a very prevalent condition affecting around 14 to 20% of the population. It's very expensive as well. These figures are quite old now, but it's been estimated to carry a direct healthcare cost of £1.5 billion pounds annually, and a total cost of the economy through loss of productivity of over £10 billion annually. While national estimates give useful information on disease, they are a simplification of the true picture. So national estimates misrepresent what's happening at a small area level, such as ward level by averaging out areas of high and low prevalence, leaving areas with unacceptably high prevalence of the disease to go unnoticed. And that can hinder equitable health resourcing and the implementation of more effective targeted interventions. Understanding how and why chronic back pain prevalence varies across England could carry substantial benefit for public health planning. Um, so this takes us to our aims. So our primary aim was to create a validated simulated data set of chronic back pain prevalence at ward level across England using a spatial microsimulation model. This data set could then be mapped. We then aim to analyse the simulated data set to try and determine why the spatial pattern of chronic back pain prevalence is the way it is, particularly focusing on the influence of physical activity. Finally, we aim to simulate the effect of policies to increase physical activity on chronic back pain using what-if analysis. So in summary, we, we wanted to know what the current situation is, why it is the way it is, and what could be done to change it. Yeah, so on to the methods. So firstly, to understand what's on the screen there, um, what we want to know, what is spatial microsimulation? So Spatial microsimulation is a technique that can be used for various things. It, it takes a survey file, for example, the Health Survey for England, that has national level data on an outcome of interest from a representative sample, but lacks data specified by a small area. It then also takes a census file that has demographic data on each small area, but no outcome of interest. It then matches people from the survey to each small area on the basis of each area's demographics. So spatial microsimulation can be used for various things. So small area estimation can be used for small area prediction as well, and also policy simulation. So in this study, we used um, a spatial microsimulation program called SimObesity. Um, which is named after its original use, um, but has validated usefulness in simulating other health variables, including musculoskeletal disease. Um, so firstly, um, HC data sets containing physical activity 
were combined with 2011 census data to give a geographically specific physical activity data set. Um, stage two then combined this with a health survey data set containing chronic back pain to leave us with a final geocoded data set combining both chronic back pain and physical activity. And these data sets were combined on the basis of constraint variables, um, which are variables that were chosen as best predicting physical activity and chronic back pain on the basis of our logistic regression analysis and internal validation of simulation outputs. So I won't go into detail in this presentation on um, the constraint selection and model validation process. But the output of the final simulation was then mapped and analyzed using spatial autocorrelation and geographically weighted regression. And finally, what if analysis was performed by altering individuals' moderate to vigorous physical activity levels in the input health survey data sets and then repeating the simulations? So I'll touch on these methods um, of analysis a bit more when we go through the results. But um, yeah, so primarily we were looking to simulate and map chronic back pain prevalence across England. So this is the mapped output of our final simulation. Um, darker colour indicates higher prevalence. Um, in this, you can begin to see a pattern of high prevalence along the East Coast and in the Southwest with relatively low prevalence in the Southern Central area. So next, we took this output and analysed for spatial autocorrelation. Um, so here we have our local Moran's Eye Eliza cluster map. So this map shows areas of significantly high or low prevalence in the context of their neighbouring wards. So, for example, high high um, in the dark red indicates a high prevalence ward amongst other high wards. So a cluster of high prevalence, whilst high low indicates a high prevalence ward in a relatively low prevalence region. So a spatial outlier. Um, and then the same follows for the low prevalence wards in blue. So low lows, low surrounded by low wards and low high is an outlier low ward. Um, so looking at this, you can, you can now really see those clusters of high prevalence along the east coast and in the southwest. Um, Herefordshire as well on the Welsh borders, another notable cluster of high prevalence. Um, there's also a relatively large area containing clusters of high prevalence where the borders of South Yorkshire, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire meet. Low prevalence clusters can be seen in the South, um, especially in and around London, as well as cities of the Midlands and North. OK, so next for this project, we were particularly interested in the influence of physical activity or specifically physical inactivity on chronic back pain prevalence. Um, it being a possible target for interventions to reduce chronic back pain. So firstly, if you just compare side by side the maps of um, chronic back pain prevalence and physical inactivity prevalence, you can see that there's a, a very similar spatial pattern there. Um, we analysed the association between physical inactivity and chronic back pain using geographically weighted regression so I've, I've only displayed the um, geographically weighted regression results in a very brief form here, but to just summarize what they showed. So um, initial univariate geographically weighted regression found a strong positive correlation between physical inactivity and chronic back pain prevalence at war level. Um, this relationship was largely explained in the multivariate GWR model by confounders. And um, these confounders were the proportion of residents that are over 60 in low skilled jobs, female, obese, smokers, um, white or black people, and disabled people as well. So, next we went on to our final aim, which was um, simulating the counterfactual scenarios for increases in physical activity levels. So, to do this, we used a previously validated method, which was altering um, physical activity values of participants in the input health survey data set and then rerunning the simulation. Um, so we did this for increases of um, 
moderate uh, vigorous physical activity of 15 minutes, 30 minutes and 60 minutes. And we found a detectable reduction in chronic back pain prevalence for increases of 30 minutes and 60 minutes, but found no detectable change for the 15-minute uh, increase. So what, what can we take from all this? So chronic back pain prevalence varies at ward level across England. Uh, generally, we've seen that there are clusters of high prevalence, predominantly in coastal areas, and low prevalence in cities. At an area level, physical inactivity is highly positively correlated with chronic back pain, and that's largely explained by confounders. Policies to reduce physical inactivity will likely result in a significant but relatively small reduction in chronic back pain prevalence. Yeah, so just finally um, briefly discuss a bit about the strengths and limitations of this study and possible future directions. So the real strength of this project was the use of the spatial microsimulation methodology. Um, this allowed us to simulate our other variables of interest besides the outcome variable at a small area level, whilst maintaining the relationship between variables at the micro level. Um, we also used two high quality data sources in that of the 2011 census and the four years of the health survey for England that we use. Um, to touch on a few limitations, firstly, the health survey uses self-reported physical activity data, which is inferior to using a more objective measure like accelerometer data. But obviously, this is quite unrealistic uh, of an aim for the requirements of the data set for use in this study. Um, secondly, is the term back pain. So we gained um, chronic back pain data from the 2017 health survey, um, but the health survey for England doesn't differentiate between lower and thoracic back pain. So um, that's why our, our, back pain, uh, our outcome was just back pain. Um, so the problem with that is it affects the comparability with wider um, epidemiological literature, which tends to focus on lower back pain. Um, so that's kind of a consideration for future health surveys, um, chronic pain questions. Finally, um, this study is um, limited by the use of a static spatial mark simulation model. Um, so it means that the time period of the simulation is dictated by the years of the data sets we use to construct it. So this isn't a current day estimation of chronic back pain prevalence. Um, in terms of future work, there's a lot of avenues um, to explore. Um, to mention a few, work could be done to simulate chronic back pain at a finer spatial scale for specific areas of interest. Um, so even at ward level, you've got that averaging out that I mentioned earlier at the national level. So within a ward, there might be pockets of extremely high prevalence that we're currently unaware of. Um, we focused on the influence of physical inactivity on chronic back pain, um, but following on from this work, it would now be easier to simulate scenarios for changes in other predictors of chronic back pain, such as obesity. So that would be something to consider. And finally, um, a dynamic or pseudo-dynamic model um, could be constructed to overcome the issues that we've got with this out-of-date estimate. Well, thank you very much. And we move on now to our final talk, our last two speakers. Joanna Semlien is an academic psychologist based at the University of East Anglia with expertise in LGBT plus health inequalities. And Jane Skinner is a lecturer in medical statistics at the University of East Anglia. She specialises in the analysis of large observational data sets. So over to Joanna and Jane. And can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Yes. Yay. <laughs> so what we're bringing to the party is we're a double act and our slides worked. So on that note, we're, um, yes, we're already a success. So wonderful. Thank you so much for um, that introduction. And I shall um, talk for a bit, then I'll hand over to Jane. And then Jane's going to hand back to me, which... Um, hopefully will all function completely seamlessly.
I feel like I'm speaking to a, um, an audience that are fully um, aware of the opening bullet point. But, you know, I think it's worth stating that uh, we really need to be monitoring health inequalities. Um, it's an important part of uh, public health policy, and that sort of underpins a huge amount of um, work that everybody here today is, is, is undertaking. Um, specifically, though, I also want to refer to sexual orientation, identity, and its and the need for recording that. Um, from uh, there are multiple reasons why I need to keep repeating this because I've been probably speaking to this bullet point for about six or seven years, and I still find myself um, not needing to delete it from my slides um, because. Obviously, we need to comply with equal opportunities legislation, and everyone is, of course, setting out and intending to do that. Um, but the recording of sexual orientation identity is really not happening as standard um, at all. And um, in order for us to comply with equal opportunities legislation, but also to allow us to monitor sexual minority health, we really need to be recording that. Um, but actually, um, we don't really have the kind of ongoing data to look at, but luckily, we have national health surveys. Um, so that makes us very happy. Here's a little bit of background, a little sort of intro for you around um, why, why are we looking at sexual um, minority populations? Why is this important? Well, there's been a growing uh, evidence base around um, health disparities in this group over the last, uh, certainly growing over the last decade. Um, starting with, there was a, a very significant systematic review looking at mental health, um, which was published in 2008, um, showing that a uh, significant increased risk um, in, of certainly around suicidality, around um, depression, anxiety, but also substance misuse. Um, we looked, started then, but that was very US centric. So then we managed to um, start to analyze data from the health, uh, the UK health surveys. So initially we've looked at smoking and found that LGB young adults are more likely to smoke. And that was using LSIT, which is now um, next steps. We can also set, see that we've got, so we have mental health, we have risk behaviors. We also know that at least 80% of uh, um, this data is uh, about 10 years old now, but you know, just to give you a kind of line in the sand, discrimination and, and harassment is really significant in this population. And there is a theoretical kind of underpinning um, called minority stress theory, which is, and um, this, this posits really that there's both an internal and an external manifestation of that received prejudice. Uh, victimization, social stigma, and that that is what's underlying the health differences that we're observing. And this could and, and offers a per perfectly um, reasonable um, explanation for for what is um, what what may be what may be going on. Um, the other sort of background, really, that I want to present is that um, the LGB and O. I'm going to come to the O in a minute and explain that to you, but LGBO health inequalities research, as I said, there is a kind of, there is a, a growing evidence base, but uh, it's extremely impoverished in terms of its quality. Um, lots and lots of poor quality papers, lots of uh, small community samples being used, snowball sampling as a technique, um, questionnaires that haven't been validated, and um, sadly, huge amounts of repetition, which the population constantly take part in surveys, which really, um, I find quite frustrating, but anyway. So we've then got a field that's uh, really, it's an unfunded research field, um, lots of un unpublished um, papers. It's an under-researched population and actually a poorly funded research topic. And I can speak from experience. It has been a very US centric field and still is really the vast majority of publications are from um, the United States. And um, one of the issues you have, even when you're trying to understand and look at the data and the, the, the knowledge that's out there, is that there's a huge variability in the way in which sexual orientation identity is measured. Sometimes it's attraction, sometimes behavior, sometimes a self-identified category, and also lots of different data, um, data papers present different forms of aggregation and disaggregation across the different um, sexual orientation categories. That makes for a complex field and it's not very helpful in that variability. So from a UK perspective, the ONS standardized um, created a standardized question in 2009, which was a fantastic breakthrough in terms of the UK situation. This is the question that still stands. 
and it um, began to be incorporated in the UK National Health Surveys, which was a fantastic game changer in terms of us being able to look at UK, the UK picture. Just very briefly on other, you noticed in the previous question, one of the options was the word, was, um, was the category other. This is important and significant because it is an option other than lesbian, gay and bisexual, but also other than heterosexual. And of course, there is an option to um, say that one doesn't know or refuse. That's a, a verbal option that's available. So it is a meaningful category that people are choosing. They're actively choosing that. So back in 2016, um, when I looked at common mental disorder in this population, I included the group other. And I did the same when we also went ahead and analysed, looked at BMI in this group. And those are the two papers um, that are referenced just there. And both of those we included other and found um, an association with higher risk of men uh, poor mental health and unhealthy weight compared to um, the comparative groups in those analyses. That is a meaningful category, but it's very heterogeneous. It is a, you know, arguably a limitation in and of itself to conclude much from it, but I still intend and have continued and will today be presenting data on that group because it may well include people who are not comfortable with those categories um, and or may have a gender identity other than the male female options that are provided in the surveys at the moment. There may be age differences in that as well, but younger people are choosing other, but nevertheless, um, it is definitely a category of, um, I think, of, of importance. So I basically covered what I was going to say in this slide in the previous slide, but I'll just draw attention to the fact that we've used a range of data sets using IPD, and Jane's going to talk about that next, so I'm not going to preempt her. Um, very briefly, um, I've added this to the slides that are online because I did some of these slides as late as yesterday and didn't include this, but I just want to point out that the data set that we used was a pooled data set of 100,503 um, 100, people drawn from 14 um, UK surveys. And I want to give you um, before the aim, which is the wrong way around, but I just added it, the um, participants, um, the numbers of people and the percentages that identified in our categories that we have analysed today. These are lower than some of the categories we're now seeing in the um, data that's being provided by ONS um, from the APMS. Um, but I think this is because we are using older data sets and Jane, and then I perhaps repeat, we'll talk about that later. I'm going to hand over to Jane, thank you. Okay, so um, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, as you will have gathered, the um, aim that we're doing here is to examine the association between the categories that Joanna described, the LGBO sexual orientation identity, and we're looking at type 2 diabetes among adults in the UK. So um, these reflect the data that we were able to um, draw down from the UK data service. So a few years ago, um, they stopped making sexual, the, I think they still ask the question, but they stopped making the sexual orientation identity variable available. So these are somewhat older studies. So the approach we took was individual participant data meta-analysis with logistic regression to examine this association. And unlike most meta-analyses, we're not extracting data from publications. We're using the individual person level data. And we are able to identify 14 health surveys that collected data on these LGBO categories and type two diabetes. And one of the advantages of this approach is that we can um, estimate associations for smaller groups such as LGBO categories for which the original studies couldn't do because they were underpowered. So um, the way this approach works is that we calculated summary statistics for each study and then pulled those estimates and we used a random effects model because there's a range of years and places and study populations so it's reasonable to expect heterogeneity. Um, so for each study we calculated 
odds ratios and their standard errors. And these were pulled to produce an estimate of the average effect size for the studies. Um, in prelim, Joe was talking earlier about um, how you aggregate the groups. Um, we found in preliminary analyses that there weren't different effects for men and women. So we analyzed um, gay men and lesbian women together and adjusted for sex. So um, we also, um, for this, per for this um, analysis, did two main sets of analysis. One we've called minimally adjusted and one we've called additionally adjusted. So the minimally adjusted analyses are very minimally adjusted. They just included age and sex as covariates. And the additionally adjusted analyses also included smoking, drinking, BMI category, ethnic minority status, and education status. Um, we also considered marital uh, cohabiting status, consumption of five a day, physical activity, and waste measurement. And too few studies had the last two, and the first two didn't seem to be associated with the outcome. Um, this is just a single slide and I'm going to move on to the results next, but there's quite a lot of sort of hidden work behind this of harmonising different studies to produce um, the same variable. And you tend to lose complexity when you have when you do this. So, for example, smoking was, are you a current smoker? Yes, no. Um, uh, education status was, do you have a degree? That sort of thing. Okay, so um, this is a uh, forest plot of our analysis. Um, I expect most of you are familiar with that. So I'll just very brief, if you're not, I'll very briefly say that um, each, each study, contributing study is a row. And the plot shows the odds ratio and its associated confidence interval estimated from that study. And the diamond at the bottom shows the overall estimate of risk, so which was for this analysis, it's gay um, and it, men and lesbian women um, compared to heterosexuals adjusted for age and sex. So um, the um, line, coming down one is obviously the line of no effect. And you can see, um, even though the individual um, studies might not be statistically significant when you combine them, we do get a statistically significant result, which shows that gay men and lesbian women are um, have higher odds of um, developing, of having, of, sorry, of having type two diabetes. And um, when we compare that to the um, additionally adjusted model, which includes all the covariates that I mentioned on the previous slide, or the slide, last slide, but one, you can see that the effect remains. So it's suggested that it's not explained by these, these covariates. So we get a similar result for um, bisexual people. They are at... Um, they show uh, increased um, odds compared to um, heterosexual people of developing type 2 diabetes. And again, that remains um, we're moving on to the additionally. Two uh, minutes. Oh, sorry. The additional and I've given you a bit of extra because of the slide. OK, sorry. OK, so um, and similarly increased risk for the other group that Joe mentioned, um, and but that doesn't remain after adjustment. So um, all three groups showed increased risk with um, minimal adjustment and the effect remained for lesbian, gay people, and bisexual people um, after additional adjust adjustment for additional factors. So this is the first study using this data to do this analysis. Um, one proviso is that 
Um, if you're very eagle-eyed, you might have noticed that there weren't 14 studies in all of the forest plots. So because of the small numbers, some of the studies had no diabetes cases for some of the sexual orientation groups, which meant that they couldn't be included in the analysis, um, which would bias the estimates upwards. Okay, okay so um, moving over to Joe. Very, very briefly, um, three points. Um, firstly, a, a cry out that sexual orientation needs to continue to be included as standard in all health surveys. Um, my third point, which I'm going to say second, is that uh, actually I'd like us to be monitoring sexual orientation as standard in all clinical settings to allow us to target health interventions, but also that we need access to this data. So we need to be able to... Um, analyze data beyond around we've got I think it runs out around 2015 we can no longer access um, that data so um, at the moment we have a, a real gap um, in in what we're able to uh, look at so that's a kind of call for um, something to help us to be able to access um, that data but that's that's our findings that's um, our sort of final points and that gives you probably no time for questions but you can always email us <laughs>